This is a wolverine, one of the least known, most difficult to study carnivores on the planet. The largest terrestrial member of the weasel family, wolverines are imminently threatened by climate change. They're creatures of the snow and cold. They're physiologically adapted to frigid conditions, and females require deep spring snow in order to den. In the lower 48, they're found only in the mountains of the west, and the best places to see them are probably Glacier and Grand Teton National Parks. I moved to Jackson in 2008, partially because of an encounter that I had with a wolverine here. I was intrigued by this species because I identified with it. Small, happily solitary, a bit fierce, a lover of the snow and cold in mountains. Wolverines are also constantly on the move. They disperse over long distances and defend huge territories. The Tetons, fully occupied, hold about four adult wolverines. An adult male wolverine may defend a territory of up to 500 square miles, a female up to 200. As it happens, I too have a very large area in which I habitually roam. I spent my formative professional years working on wildlife conservation and environmental education in Mongolia, and I remain involved with conservation work there. Turns out, Mongolia had an unstudied population of wolverines. When I found out about it, it seemed like there was an irresistible synergy at work. When I moved out here, I volunteered with the Absorca Beartooth Wolverine Project. The project was run in association with Jackson's Northern Rockies Conservation Cooperative, where I also worked as project manager on programs to resolve grizzly and wolf conflicts. But I had a secret agenda, to gain the skills necessary to conduct the world's first research project on wolverines in Mongolia. The Jackson community has been essential to this endeavor. Local wolverine biologist Jason Wilmot has been my mentor and the scientific advisor to the project and has traveled to Mongolia with me twice. Mountain guide and wilderness advocate Forrest McCarthy spearheaded a ski expedition to Mongolia to track wolverines, and the Tetons were my training ground for honing my skiing and tracking skills. Jackson is also one of the few places where you can say, I want to go do a research project on Mongolian wolverines, and people are excited for you rather than worried about your sanity. Everyone around here has a big dream. Everyone has traveled internationally. Everyone gets being obsessed with wildlife. It's pretty energizing. But aside from self-gratification, what's the point of working on Mongolian wolverines? The challenge for this species, as the climate warms and snowpack diminishes, will be protecting it at the southern edge of its range globally. In the U.S., that's the Rockies. In the Eastern Hemisphere, it's Mongolia. We think that wolverines were wiped out of the Rockies during the anti-wolf campaigns of the 19th century. Wolverines are scavengers and efficient at finding meat, including poison bait. They also reproduce very slowly, an average of one kit per female per year. And females don't start having babies until they're three or four. They only live for about a decade. Remember, wolverines have huge territories. So limited habitat plus big territories plus slow reproductive rate means a very slow population growth rate. Wolverines are still recolonizing the Rockies. And when we study them here, we aren't necessarily seeing the dynamics of a fully saturated landscape, which makes it challenging to come up with conservation options. Mongolians, on the other hand, have a pretty strong traditional conservation ethic. Wildlife is not only admired, it's imbued with supernatural powers. The idea of wiping out a species is offensive there. So wolverines were never extirpated from Mongolia. The population there is fully functioning. Maybe we can learn something about how to conserve them here from doing comparative work in both ecosystems. One example. This spring, Jason Wilmot, Forrest McCarthy, and I embarked with two other expedition members on a month-long ski trip through northern Mongolia. For several years, local Mongolian herders had been telling me that wolverines were, quote, abundant in the area. We were trying to ascertain what abundant meant, and the best way to do this was to go while snow was on the ground and see what we could find in the way of tracks. Wolverines are never really abundant. So we set off, predicting that in a month of skiing, over a route that covered 250 miles through some of the most remote mountains in Mongolia, we might find one or two sets of tracks. It was a proverbial needle in a haystack kind of quest. You don't just go out looking for wolverines and expect to find them. 45 minutes after we set out on our first day in the field, we found our first set of tracks. By the end of 23 days in the field, we had recorded 28 sets of tracks. Every drainage we skied, we were crossing tracks, constantly. It was unprecedented. We wouldn't expect to see something like this in the States. What does it mean? We're still trying to figure that out, but it is definitely intriguing. Wolverines force us to think about conservation at a huge scale. You can't protect wolverines in the Tetons without protecting wolverines throughout the West. 
They're part of a metapopulation, a series of connected population nodes that can't survive in isolation. They transcend the old divide between state and federal management because a single state can't preserve its wolverine population alone. But the scale is even bigger than that. In the face of climate change, wolverines are the ultimate umbrella species. They push us to understand that our amazing local ecosystem is actually global and that the wolverine could help protect us all. Mongolian herders, Jackson skiers, American ranchers, the towns and cities of the West all depend economically and ecologically on the same things that wolverines depend on. We need the snow for our recreation and for water for livestock and towns alike. We need the mountains for our own renewal and for the iconic wildlife and views that drive summer tourism. Wolverines need the snow and the cold for simple things, to den and raise their kits, and to help preserve scavenged meat. But what befalls the wolverine befalls mountain communities all over the world. And it befalls all of us. There are a lot of deep divides around conservation, especially carnivore conservation in this ecosystem. The wolverine is non-controversial. It threatens no one, and its persistence on this landscape serves as a reminder that we all have common ground, regardless of where we fall on the political spectrum. We're all trying to protect our livelihoods and our values, and they're all tied to the mountains. Maybe I'm naive to attribute such unifying powers to a disreputable little mammal, but wolverines are renowned for refusing to back down. They'll stare down a bear, they hunt moose and reindeer, and they cross hundreds of miles to find new territories. If a 30-pound weasel can pull this stuff off, we should probably be capable of getting over our identity issues to come up with a sustainable energy policy that allows us all to prosper. Wolverines are up for potential listing under the Endangered Species Act. They're one of the species that makes the Tetons truly extraordinary, and they deserve protection. They embody the spirit of this place, and they link it to similar landscapes as far away as Mongolia. I'll continue to be inspired by the species, to hope for new ways to think big about conservation, and to travel my own route between these two landscapes that I love.